Dunwich. For many a Fallout fan, the name alone is enough to shrivel a ballsack and pucker the arsehole. A name that I, like many, thought had been put to rest in Fallout 3 with the destruction of the Krivbekna. Yet here we are, again. Dunwich Boars is a name given to this unholy site. On the face of it, it looks like an ordinary quarry, mining and digging for granite and other such minerals. However, as we will soon learn, they were digging for something much more sinister. To refresh everyone's minds, Dunwich Borers LLC was a company founded by Richard Dunwich, with the name Dunwich Borers being a pun on Dunwich Horrors, a story written by the late H.P. Lovecraft. Richard Dunwich was the brother of Constance Blackhall. The Blackhalls, you will remember, were a family involved in the occult and with the Krivbekna that we encountered in the Point Lookout DLC of Fallout 3. The book was taken from Point Lookout to the Dunwich building, owned by Dunwich Borers. Inside, all manner of supernatural events occurred, many like we will see here today. In the darkest depths, we encountered a vigil of ghouls, worshipping a grotesque obelisk depicting a deity, called Ogqualtoth. It is this obelisk that destroys the book. So from our previous dealings with this company, and family, we know they are heavily involved in the occult, and as this quarry will show us, that has not changed. Our first point of interest is this strange cage and fire at the bottom of the quarry. Many human bones are scattered around it, most likely because their corpses were burned up inside the flames. One creepy thing to consider is whether they were alive when this happened. Well, the inside of the cage answers that. We can find several bodies and skeletons that look like they may have been chained to the floor at some point whilst alive. Then the fire was lit and they were roasted alive, the other corpses possibly acting as fuel. Now before we progress into the boar itself, there is one more place just outside of here that we need to take a peek at. Hugo's Hole. Hugo's Hole is located right next to Dunwich Borders, and is composed of a camp composed of what I assume are blocks of granite. The outside is plastered in warning signs, telling you that the inside is irradiated. This radiation comes from a large number of barrels of waste that line the main corridor, with a powerful turret awaiting us at the end, ready to cleave your fucking kneecaps off. After giving the turret a good hiding, we come across this quaint little living space that has flamingos. So of course the person here is dwelling in the higher planes of madness. Well, as it turns out, the person in question, Hugo, is dead as a doorknob. A 10mm pistol lies beside him. Based on the blood splatter, this was clearly suicide. Also, it's a different 10mm. This one is mine that I put back after I stole his. On the desk beside him, we can find his hull tape. It gives us some insight into his madness, and a Mr. Handy model. Guys don't bother me anymore. That's good. I think it's... What was that? Can't they read the signs? I think it's time I go back inside the quarry. It's been too long. No, I can't. The guys would never let me in. I could kill them all. No. No, that would... That wouldn't be what it would want. It's time to lay down. Yes. Of course. It's next to my bed. I will. It's loaded. So he killed himself with his pistol. And you can sometimes hear this happen as you approach the hole. So it was recent. In fact, the part where he says, what was that, can't they read the signs, may refer to us approaching and the turret firing on us. He clearly is acquainted with the raiders and the boar, and being a raider himself was most likely part of their group at one point. It seems the turret and radiation was to stop them bothering him. He states he wants to go back into the quarry, but that they would not let him for some reason. He ponders killing them all, but that it would not want that. I think he is under the influence of some force and it made him act in such a way that the raiders kicked him out. The force then made him kill himself, either to stop him killing the raiders, or perhaps from talking to us. Now it is time to enter Dunwich Borders proper, and see what lies within. What is immediately apparent to me is how developed this place was just before the war. The walls are cut smoothly, and pipes and supports thread throughout the entirety of the boar. It means that a decade or more of work may have been poured into this place and all under false pretenses. The platform to the left here leads you to what will soon become a shortcut. However, 
you cannot open it until later. The first terminal to be found here is booby trapped, with a grenade being set off by this, just this quaint delightful little scale. The communication section is split into three parts. Part 1 is titled Urgent Message and is addressed to Bob Stanson, asking him to come to Station 4, and all will be explained when he arrives. Quite suspicious, I am sure you will agree, and rightly as we will soon see. Part 2 is from Bob to management. His requests for support beams are being denied. Terminal 1 has been souped up with extra padding, and everyone at Station 1 is a special snowflake. We will talk more about the support beams in coming entries. Part 3 is more ego stroking. Good cuts. Ur's fabulous. No one's killed themselves. No one's been killed. All in all, it's all good. The next section is how safety is first, which is a fucking lie as we will see. So it has taken multiple eye casualties for people to finally start wearing eye protection, which I would think will be a no-brainer. Also, management seems to take the eyes as trophies, to use as props to get their point across. Gives you an idea of what management are like. The next entry is on support beams, and I find it quite funny. They made the best, cheap, support beams they could, and then they actually say that they do this in a way to save money, instead of lives. The next part is very interesting. It tells them what to do if they hear rumbling. Now, this will become relevant as you proceed deeper, but you will experience rumbling at multiple points inside this bore. The last one talks about railings, so several people have, unfortunately, fallen to their deaths. As a result, management has bought some railings to protect everyone. However, many are rusted and are only checked on twice a year. At the end, they say, in a sort of roundabout way, that everyone needs to stop complaining about the broken things that prevent them from dying. So as you can see, safety truly was first. The first thing they didn't give a fuck about. Finally, we come to upcoming events. The first of which is happy hour, which was anything but. The bill was split equally among everyone and taken from their pay. Seems fur wait, wait no it's not. If it's split, that means everyone's charged the same, which means the alcoholics have to pay as much as the people who only drank a bit, or not at all. Also, Jerry, a bucking agent, fell to his death. Next is the picnic, which will take place even if it's pissing rain. They were even thoughtful enough to get a killing machine to watch the children. I thoughtful. I do have a few thoughts on this picnic, which we'll come back to. So the company does not care about safety. They constantly try to wave off any complaints and insist it's probably being taken care of. Maybe. Eh. It's like they're trying to show that they're being safe while at the same time trying to be as unsafe as possible. Look what happened to poor Jerry for Christ's sake. We can find the camps of a few raiders set up about the place. Showing they were here for the long haul. To the left here is a room of loot with a cheeky grenade trap outside it. From this point on, the sheer scale of this place hits you. The walls are all cut uniform, so it's all been mined, but to such an extent constantly going higher to the ceiling and lower and deeper into the ground, that it's clear that it was more than rocks they were after. The Station 2 terminal is next. Once again, there's an urgent communication to the station manager, asking them to come to Station 4, while remaining just as vague. The next entry is on the new boring machine they got, which has helped increase their output, so management has no problem forking out for machines that will dig deeper but can't stand spending for safety. In the update entry, we learn that Station 3 was slowing down the progress for Station 2, or at least John seemed to think so. However, this may not be the case. After that, we can look at this boy over here, clearly loving life. Or at least they were. Seems like they may have been on a lunch break, though drinking and then operating this huge machine is probably not the best idea. Once again, it shows you just how much safety was valued here. Further on, we come to what was referred to as the pit in the happy hour entry, and come across the station 3 terminal. Once again, the urgent message is present, and as we're progressing closer to the station mentioned, it's evident that it's deep within the earth. The railings request entry once again displays management's disregard for safety, as the request was put in a while ago. Near the pit, they will be needed even more so than any war we have seen thus far. The updated entry reveals that John's bitching seems to be a constant thing, and the fault lies in their lack of essential equipment. As we descend, you may want to turn the lights on, as it is a habit you will want to get into from here on out. The last of the raiders are found at the bottom of this pit, with their leader. A terminal can be found on the back of this vat, containing some of the raiders' entries. The first entry is entitled Cleaning House. The entry references Saugus Ironworks and its leader, Slag, which we'll look at in another video. 
The output of Iron Dawn here has stopped, and this person was sent to sort it out. They find the people already here, whispering to themselves about things they hear in the mine. And then we're told, for the first time, that furrows are present here. The next entry tells us that the group sent down to take care of the ghouls didn't make it back, and that they need to dig deeper into the mine, which just did not end well and may be the cause of much that has happened. The last one tells us how the whole digging deep thing probably turned out. I'm safe in the light. Seems like a mantra, or a prayer of sorts, and as we will soon see, they were right. Sort of. A mini nook can be found on the ledge to the left, and then it's deeper into the bore we go, to get mauled by ghouls. A miner's corpse can be found to the left here, and like so many others, it looks like they died in the middle of work. So I shit myself here, and it's because, from this point onwards, you're gonna start to hear spooky noises behind you. Splashing, walking, squelching, etc. More miner's corpses can be found here, once again, all seemingly dead on their feet. Though these two ones may have passed out drunk and then died based on the beer. Turning the lights on is an option, but ghouls jump you when it happens. Up ahead, we find a corpse on a forklift, and a withered ghoul, suggesting both have been here for some time. We also get introduced to our first flashback inside this boar. So we can get a closer look at the individuals we see in the flashback, and it's quite clear this fellow was a filthy witch, perhaps the source of all goings on inside this boar. Also, if we assume that this happened just before the bombs dropped, then it did happen while they worked. It appears which chur lad was driving the forklift, then the lights go out and ghouls attack. Remember, I'm safe in the light. Well, whatever force inside the boar is none too happy about that, and kills them. We only see the corpse of one of the men, and yet a very old and dead ghoul is present as well. The remains of the raider group can be found on here, and then we can get access to a shortcut further on up. To the right is another corpse, and this appears to be Station 5. And from here to Station 6, there are no more terminals. We can see that the raiders were spread out quite a bit in their fight, and one poor sod even tried to hide underneath the stairs, though it doesn't look like it ended too well. At the top of the stairs, we come to another switch and group of ghouls. Further down this corridor, we come to a final set of stairs. These lead to the chain door we found at the start, with the key present on the corpse. The key belonging to perhaps the only manager that knew what was truly going on. Back to where the visions happened, we find another corpse and withered ghoul. Look at the goggles near the ghoul, with this one and the previous one near the forklift, not to mention the corpses all seem to be from workers who died in the middle of work. I am of the opinion that some of these ghouls were the workers from inside the boar, perhaps even all of them. The sneak bobblehead can be found next to Terminal 4, the last one, which sheds some much needed light on this place. It gives us a hollow tape from Tim Schutz, the same person whose key opened up the shortcut. Tim Schutz here. No suspicions were raised when the new equipment was brought in the other day. Crew at Station 4 are still under the impression that we are setting up a new station beyond this area. The standing crew you hired are convincing enough. However, do worry about the project managers at the other stations. Especially Bob at Station 1. We all know he takes his job very seriously. His bullet point updates bug the hell out of me. My gut tells me he'll figure out something's going on down here sooner rather than later. Please advise. So new equipment was brought in. However, it was not for the purpose of further station construction, but for something else entirely. A crew was hired that's purpose was clearly not the same as the others. Or else, why did they need to be convincing? Tim is also aware of Bob's shit, but that he is a dedicated worker and that he may figure something out soon. He asked for advice on what to do, which is no doubt why the meeting of managers was held. Now, once again, when we journey into this hole, we are given a flashback, one which we will take a close look at. So a group of people are tied up and kneeling around a candlelit altar, with some fruit bar waving a knife around in the podium. This is going to end well. I have a good feeling about this. Anyway, based on the seats around this chamber, and the way it's not cut from the rock, like the rest of the quarry, there's a good chance that this was already here, and that they unearthed it. Then they conducted this ritual, which I'm sure happened at the same time as the managers were called at Area 4. I think this because, after we come out of the vision, we can find them. John, Bradley and Bob are all ghouls and attack us straight away. The other ghoul by the pool where the podium once stood is Tim, and it's the same person that was conducting the ritual, if the book strapped to his arse is anything to go on. We find the last hollow tape, this one from management. Tim, 
job on keeping things under wraps. We've taken your advice and have asked the other project managers to meet you at Station 4. Stall them if they arrive before we get there. They haven't been told anything. We are very close to accomplishing our goal. Please be patient. You will be rewarded in time. Tim knew about this the whole time, and suggested they lure the other project managers here, who were no doubt among the kneeling people in the ritual. They were ambushed and tied up. Management then tells Tim that they are close to completing their goal, and he will be rewarded. Well, the reward was becoming a ghoul. This all happened just before the bombs dropped, and the platform is now gone. They're all ghouls, and to this point I think many of the other people became ghouls as well. This is done with shenanigans, remember. And we have already seen evidence of one or more entities influencing the people here. Their reach seems to extend beyond the boar as well, based on Hugo. Now all that is left is to enter the hole. Do not do so on power armor, you will get stuck in the bottom, because Bethesda are scumbags. So the hole is deep, and I recommend putting on the suit you find in Hugo's hole. At the bottom, we find a small opening that emerges into a large chamber with similar architecture to the room upstairs. A skeleton sits at the entrance, though I have no idea how it got here. On the altar are two many nukes and a sacrificial blade, crim of his tooth. It looks like a wicked thing and, as the description says, more likely than not its purpose was to cause pain and for use in rituals and sacrifices. Although it's not this blade present in the ritual, but this could be a mistake in Bethesda's part. Well, that's everything. Uh, uh, oh wait, yeah, the giant face. Now before we get into that, let me remind you that this is based on Lovecraft, and as such I believe this face is a reference to the Shunned House, a story where the protagonist finds part of the elbow of a huge titan buried under the house. Based on that, the blade, and the giant head. I think this may have been such an entity, and I'm going to refer to them as Krimva. Dunwich were using the quarry as a cover as they tried to free or excavate this thing. The rumblings heard throughout the quarry may have been Krimva moving or trying to break free. I have no doubt that this is the entity that exerted its will on Hugo and the other raiders, compelling them to dig deeper or killing Hugo to prevent him from interfering. The runes and altars we find here suggest to me that Krimva is not the only thing buried, but that a greater structure, or even a city, may lie beneath here, which is also a running theme within Lovecraft's novels, as are great sleeping entities. So this is Dunwich Borers, owned by the same company that built a building over the statue of Ogqualtoth, and had connections to Black Hall and the Kravbekna. The quarry was full of safety hazards, and it's clear the company did not care about the employees. Knowing what we know now, it is possible that they wanted deaths to occur, for the people who died to act as tributes to Krimva. Tim was the only manager that knew what was going on, and so he hatched a plan to lure the other managers down to the unearthed ritual site, which was excavated and manned most likely by the tools and team that Tim talks about. I also think this happened during the picnic, which would explain why there are so many people there that are not dressed from the mines. Perhaps the families of the miners were used as a useful source of sacrifices. Then they conducted the ritual to the great sleeping titan below. Here is where I think the bombs dropped. However, they're all in a quarry with thick walls and hundreds of meters underground, and not too close to the blast site. So I don't think they died or were turned into ghouls by the bombs. I think it happened due to Krimva. As we discussed with Ogqualtooth, Radiation is something that these entities seem to thrive on, and their choice of slaves seems to be a feral ghoul, who are much more susceptible to mental control. Indeed, if granite was present in this mine, it itself can be very radioactive. I think the ritual broke the altar and exposed part of Krimva, and in the process turned the workers into ghouls. However, Krimva was not free, so it needed someone to keep digging. It waited, and eventually Hugo and the raiders turned up and began to dig. Now it is also possible that it just needed more sacrifices, and used its ghouls to achieve that, which would explain why they attacked the raiders instead of letting them dig. I think Hugo was further under the manipulation than others. Indeed, given that he had the radiation suit, I think he is the one who placed those mini nukes on the altar, and acted as the avatar of sorts of Krimva. However, he got away or was chased away, and then talks about returning, and then about killing the raiders, perhaps to stop Krimva from returning. However, Krimva still holds sway over him, and gets him to kill himself before he can do so. What exactly Krimva is, how it was imprisoned, and what else is down there are questions that we don't have the answers for. 
However, this is not the first time an area of Dunwich has been left open-ended, only to be given a proper conclusion in some DLC. One thing I can say for certain is that this is not the last we will see of this entity. Another chapter in one of the darkest places in the Fallout universe. I hope you enjoyed our look at it. If you did, give the video a like, and if you want regular updates, subscribe. Any suggestions for lower or future videos should be left in the comments below. Better yet, go on to my subreddit so we can discuss them in more detail. It's linked in the description. If you wish to, you can support me on Patreon, which is also linked in the description. Go have a gander at the rewards. Follow me on Twitter or Facebook to get regular updates or have a wee chat. Any business you wish to discuss, email me at nthapple.business at gmail.com and I will get back to you as soon as possible. I hope you enjoyed the episode, and I hope to see you in the next one. And until then, goodbye.